Yo, um, friends of the cucumber land, welcome to laser gurken land. Um, as you can see, we have this brand new IP address here, um, like introduced the first time visually on this channel. Um, it's is it the first time? No, it isn't. I showed it in the browser once. Uh, like yeah, whatever. So it's eight eight dot two one four dot five six dot nine four. I own this IP address, um, so I will have access to that IP address for some time. The domain zillihoon.com is only paid uh, this year, but I will probably keep paying for the domain, but I already paid this uh, IP address. So yeah, that's about the stability of those, um, yeah of those things um, because yeah I don't know I'm I'm having some long-term uh, plans here and you, you never know what what changes and what happens that's why I uh, try to be as transparent as possible to um, yeah to tell you guys so I still own the old IP address but um, this new IP address um, has better hardware resources that's why this um, server is running on a new address um, all right but probably I will be always pointing the domain um, as long as I pay for the domain uh, to the correct um, server that's um, that's for sure um, yeah so that's about how you can connect and what the server even is is um, it's a vanilla server currently um, because we do not have many players here, I do not need to get some optimized Minecraft forks um, and we can still play like actual plain vanilla, vanilla vanilla, and have it um, a anarchy server. So yeah, there are no, no rules on the server and you can do whatever you want. I have enough storage and you can explore the world even with your fly hacks and so on and um, yeah the world will not be reset and the server will not go anywhere um, yeah in the in the next few years so if you plan to play a long-term um, Minecraft adventure on a freely reachable um, server with barely any players so um, if you go a little bit away from spawn or if I stop actively uh, advertising for the server, um, I'm sure it will be probably kind of empty. So if you're interested in having like your own free server, right? So it's um, I'm actually hosting a, a word for you. That's how how I see it. Um, but you can you can get whatever um, you want out of this uh, thing. Um, Yes, so I did some things off camera and this two bees two knees um, actually visited me. So I got my third visitor and yeah, it was kind of chill. And I kept, yeah, repairing the, the things. Um, Yeah, so um, I'm still uh, working on the cows uh, to like get to the absolute limits of this uh, server and see how how well it performs because uh, yeah that that's what the hardware will be for the for the next time yeah that yeah he was here um, And yeah, and I try to play a little bit more active here and check in because yeah, new server and see how how it performs and so on. Um, we had some downtime yesterday. I I have to look into um, restarting it automatically um, when it crashes or whatever happened there. I, I do not know yet, so bear with me here. Um, new uh, new server. I will, yeah, I will in the beginning for sure invest some time here to make sure everything runs uh, properly and then um, I can be, 
inactive um, without checking in on the server for some years and it should still be be running right um, and that's that's the plan so far and today I have a special video um, so it's something new um, because it seems like all the Defcon and Brian Clough videos are, yeah I, I, I feel like I've watched them all I'm or I'm too lazy to um, extensively search for new ones because I get recommended the same all the time and I I suck at searching things so that's why we switch the topic to blender and we're watching a video from the official blender channel um, which currently has uh, five uh, five hundred ninety thousand subscribers a video from 2017 so it's kind of old but it's I feel like it's the beginning of a series that still exists. I'm not too sure though. Um, yeah, I gave that guy a totem um, that was named by Lide and uh, yeah, he needed it to fight against Lide, so that was kind of ironic. So yeah, it was to be expected that he renames it before duping it to hell. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Um, so I feel like it's the beginning of a series and it's about the title of the video is scripting for artists so it's uh, a thingy of uh, how Python um, the, the Python API works or I, th I think scripting inside Blender I don't know something like that I didn't watch it yet so um, that's uh, um, yeah, and I'm 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 kind of I'm kind of excited. Um, yeah, so even if it's a still video, I doubt that the Python API changed a lot. Uh, it's more the UI that changes a lot, but um, I think the Python uh, should be still the same. But uh, let's see. Um, maybe this will be our new favorite series in my uh, so to say second season of playing here and um yeah then that was as always a long introduction um then i would say let's get started with the video and i shut up and this is a scripting for artists it's actually a training course on blender cloud and how many people are blender cloud subscribers oh that's so good yeah, thank you all because you, you're paying my salary among other things. So it's, <laughs> it's really great. Uh, who of you have seen the Training for Artists uh, course that actually exists on the cloud? few people who have, who have looked at it, a few videos? All right, well, that's good. I'm trying to cover a bit of the training as it is on the cloud and then skip some parts to keep you guys interested in what else is on there and also cover some things that people asked for but are not in the cloud uh, stuff yet. Um, it's aimed at artists who not necessarily want to become a programmer, um, but from scripting could still be very useful if you do any mundane monkey work that it... What if I'm a programmer who actually don't want to become an artist? LOL! <laughs> Wait, did he say it the other way around, right? I wasn't in the kitchen. So. For but are not in the cloud uh, stuff yet. Um, it's aimed at artists who not necessarily want to become a programmer. Uh, yeah, GG. I'm. I wouldn't call myself a programmer, but I feel I'm a little bit more the other way around. I hope for like escaping the confusing Blender UI by using Python and not bothering too much with the artistic things. <laughs> <laughs> um, but from scripting could still be very useful if you do any mundane monkey work that is doing the same thing over and over again then scripting could be for you um, so basically it starts with scratching your own edge it doesn't have to be production ready it doesn't have to be very fancy as long as it works for you that's fine and you can already save a lot of time um, so basically it is getting to get Blender to press its own buttons that's the, that's the whole goal. Um, we're going to use Python for that, which is uh, a programming language that you, Blender is using. So in the end, you will be a Blender programmer. A 
little bit about me. Uh, I got a PhD on crowd simulation uh, before I started working at the uh, Blender Institute Animation Studio thing. Uh, I've been working in there since uh, 2016. Uh, I had got my first commit rise to Blender in 2014 and I've been programming stuff since 91. Um, Boy. Then there's two very important things. Uh, this is a workshop, so it's not about me talking for an hour and then you guys just absorbing. Uh, so please, interrupt me. Um, I will try to keep my mouth shut every once in a while to get so you have some space to think, but if I don't do that enough, just interrupt me and, and ask stupid questions. Even though if it is, uh, dude, I, I have no idea what you're saying right now, just interrupt me, ask about it, we can discuss it, maybe somebody else in the audience uh, knows how to explain what I'm trying to explain in a way that clicks with you. Uh, so that's what I wanted to say about that. Oh yeah, and the video is uh, like one, one hour long. One thing to realize when Maybe you that's start worth mentioning. programming computers is that they but are But I assume really, you, see, really you see the uh, video they links anyways. They will just anyways. do as they're being told. Um, Python is called an imperative language, which means that you tell the computer, do this, then do this, then do this. Uh, to give an example, Prolog is uh, a programming language that is uh, more logical, so you can actually describe your problem and then tell the computer, please, computer, answer me this question. <laughs> and it's, it's awesome, but it doesn't work for Python, so you really have to lay out the steps that it needs to do. Uh, one example is that I've seen people say, okay, A equals the lo X location of this object. And then they start changing the location of the object and they assume that the computer understands that A should always symbolically mean the X location of that object. But it doesn't happen that way. It just computer just sees A equals location plus five, maybe. And it will compute that, it says 10. Okay, A is 10, that's it. And then from then on, A is always 10. So it's a different way of, of thinking about things. As I said, it's a workshop, so if you have a laptop and you want to type along, please do. If right. you have any of your own scripts that you want to discuss, could also be cool. Um, so, roughly the outline of what we're going to talk about, um, we're going to look at mindless copy-pasting. Blender is really good at that. You can just copy-paste stuff from the user interface into your script, it'll work. Uh, so that's pretty awesome. Then we're going to look a little more, bit more in depth about names and objects because that plays a critical role in, in programming these things. And then we'll look at stuff on lists because that's usually what you do. It's I have this list of a thousand objects that I want to look through and do things with. Um, so we'll by then we'll be able to do that. <coughs> then on the cloud, I look at data types, strings, numbers meshes, that kind of stuff, and collections, lists, dictionaries, sets. I keep those as a teaser for you guys. Um, and then we can get to stuff that I don't cover on the cloud, which is don't mind mindlessly copy-paste, and, and I will explain why. Um, turning your code into an add-on, people have asked me that a lot, like, oh cool, you're explaining scripting, so you're going to tell us how you make an add-on. Like, no, that's not on there. So we'll, we'll cover that here. And I also got some questions and about uh, the production of the actual videos. I have my face in there on top of Blender and it can be hidden and, and shown and I can cut it. And I also use scripting for that. And some drivers and some Blender magic to get it all working. So maybe we'll get to this. I have no idea about the timing of all of this because that depends a lot on you guys how much you let me talk and how much you do the talking yourself, how many questions we get, how many discussion we can get. Um, so I really don't mind if we only cover the first three bits. That's, that's all fine. Maybe we cover everything. We'll just see where we end up. So mindlessly copy-pasting, that is pretty much the basic where you want to start. Oh, by the way, how, how many of you have actual Python knowledge? Uh, that's quite a lot. How many of you are say, okay, I don't know how to program stuff and I want to learn? Uh, that's also good. Nice. Uh, nice that's tricky nice on such so a diversified the crowd, story, I guess. Uh, the first few slides will be familiar. Mm. Um, 
Oh no, let's so skip a little bit. You can read it free. Double. Okay, now we're in Blender. Nice. And apparently maximizing. Uh, there we go. I skipped to seven if minutes. The interface size big enough? Can you guys read what's down here? Like if I say one plus two, you guys can can you read it free? There we go. So you can do math. And three times four is twelve. And three plus four times five uh, equals twenty-three because multiplication goes before addition. Python is smart like that. <laughs> uh, if you want to do three plus four first and then the times five, you have to use the brackets and then you get thirty-five. So usually, I don't even grab a calculator when I'm on my desktop. I just start Python and type everything there. Um, Boy, I start Blender and then type in there. <laughs> just give me, uh, I want to print a little header, it's like 50 stars or, or 25 A's. And I was looking for the string type and functions on it. It did, doesn't exist, but you can just do five times A and then you get five A's. <laughs> so, um, let's just stick to uh, Blender here for a moment. If you have this cube, yeah, this is a bit awkward. Uh, you can hover it there. Uh, and in the tooltip, you can see that there's a little bit of Python. If you don't see it, you can turn it on in your user preferences. And that bit of Python gives you a lot of information that you need. Uh, from heart, I hope it's right, I can't read it. Uh, is bpy.data.objects square bracket quote cube quote square bracket dot location dot Ooh, flex. square bracket something yeah <laughs> zero some on the x um, and that is actually Python code that you can type in to get the location of uh, of the cube oh come on so There we go. Which is zero at the moment because it's default cube at zero. And we can move it on the x axis and then it's changed. So that's how you can get the, the x location of the cube instead of square bracket zero. Right? If one is uh, the y and then two is the z, you can also do dot x, uh, the y order z. And you can also get the location, which is the three numbers. So if you want to do anything based on the location of the object, if it's in a certain area or in your scene and you want to hide it or show it, this is what you could use. Yes. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry. Um, usually this is where the timeline is, but because I'm not doing animation at the moment, but this, this, uh, this one, uh, I cheated because I copy pasted it off the slide that I have here in front of me. Um, this one I typed in um, because these are actual input fields and if you copy an input field then uh, it will copy the value. The mindless copy pasting comes a little bit later when we go look at uh, things in menus and buttons and everything because you can copy paste those as well. Sorry? Yeah. Uh, I have, I have, because I'm used to using tab on a shell prompt and, and everything, so I've rebound my tab key, otherwise it just jumps that way. Uh, but control space is the default for the autocomplete. Uh, so you can type vpi.data dot control space and then look at everything you can type after that. So all the objects live in dot objects. Uh, I only have one, so it autocompletes to a cube. Uh, you may have noticed that I was using the double quotes, whereas Blender is now using the single quotes. Doesn't matter as long as you're consistent. Uh, if you want to do uh, it's me, you put it in double quotes because then you have a, a single quote in your text. Uh, if you want to have uh, he said hi you would use single quotes because then you have double quotes in your text. It doesn't really 
really matter which one. Um, so we have the you, there you can use arrow up and down to go back and forth in history. It saves a lot of typing. It has a location property. There we go, and a dot x. And if we go back here, you can see that you can also change it. You can say that equals 1. And then immediately the cube jumps to location 1. So you could use this to, for example, align objects to, uh, to the grid or to anything that you want to Maybe you've calculated where something has to be, then you can just put it there. Uh, you can say dot y plus equals, that means to increment 0.1, and then we can just that walk. Or you can say, well, I want it at uh, 1 to 0 0.3 with uh, oh, equals. And then you construct a which is called a tuple, it's a thingy that has multiple thingies in it. That's about as generic as you can get. Uh, and Blender understands that a tuple of three numbers will match with that uh, location. So then it just puts the cube there. As for the mindless copy pasting, let's do some of that. So we can say add mesh uh, cube. Oh, let's try another one, like an icosphere. Then you see here, I, I won't use the mouse to point it out because then the thing moves again. But here you see primitive icosphere add. And this is what we call an operator, which is why it lives in the bpy.ops namespace. And this is the code that is actually called when you press that menu. <gasps> no! Hit control C. There's another hole. And Fuck. here in your code, control V, there you have it. You press enter and then add the 3D cursor as you used to. Uh, to get that object. Yes. Ah. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh yeah, by the way, if you have questions and you you want them to be on the, on the live stream and on the recorded video, you have to use this one. Otherwise, I will just repeat the question because that's a little bit easier. So the question was, uh, do you just hover and then press Ctrl C? Yeah, that's all there is to it. Uh, Oh, by the way, this is also true with these guys. I used to click on it, and then everything is selected. Then I click Control C. You don't have to. You can just hover over any input, and then Control C will also work. Control V for paste will also work. Hmm. Wait, what? No, I didn't. Listen. By the way, this is also true with these guys. I used to click on it, and then everything is selected. Then I click Control C. You don't have to. You can just hover over any input, and then Control C will also oh, work. Oh, that's Ctrl nice. V for paste will also work. Crazy. So this is already pretty cool. We and dangerous. Now create uh, create a primitive. I didn't put this in my slides, but there is a. Uh, I'll cover that later. You can also set the location of the three D cursor, so you can control where it goes. You can also pass it a location here as a parameter. Uh, there's a lot of things you can add between these brackets to specify exactly what you want to have. So these options that you get in the user interface for how many uh, subdivisions and the location and the rotation and all align with you. All these things are actually options that you can get here. So you do an opening bracket and then again you take control space and then you see well we have view align equals false. Well that's the default. It doesn't align with your view by default. If you say view align equals true, it does. Uh, but m probably more useful is the number of subdivisions, the size, uh, the rotation is in there, the location is in there. So if you want to create uh, 300 different icospheres of a certain size at specific locations, then it's fairly easy to do. Yeah. Oh yeah, I can. Um, I can do it now if you want. I can also do it when it's in the stuff on this. Uh, well, Probably have it there. No. Let's just do it. There we go. 
Nice. So, yeah, that's easy to do. <laughs> Let's move back here. So, this is what we've just seen. So, where do you find this information? There is uh, the primary resource for me is still the Blender's user interface. You can go to the manual, but then you have to know that maybe Suzanne internally is called a monkey, or maybe it was the opposite. I always forget. Whereas in the user interface, you can just copy paste stuff, so that is a good source. There's also Blender's API documentation um, on docs.blender.org, and the Python standard library, and it's also very well documented. So there's a lot of things in Python itself that you can use in your scripts, and the, the, the Blender developers really try to keep the Python that is bundled with Blender as standard as possible so that you can take any um, Python tutorial and apply it to Blender and it will respond in the same way. Of course, generic Python tutorial will not cover Blender specific stuff, but at least uh, Blender won't get in your way of the Python specific stuff. So to recap, computers are stupid, really important. We've seen how to use the Python console in Blender. We've seen how to copy paste stuff, and we've seen some uh, sources of information. Uh, we've used the console for calculating stuff and for modifying the scene. Are there any questions about this so far? Yes. Is it possible to link IPython to to this Python? I have no experience with that. Uh, I know I would love it. Uh, this Python console, especially when it comes to history, like what the arrows up and down do, is slightly different from what Python does. Mm -hmm. And the IPython out to complete is really powerful, uh, and there is lots more going on there. So I would. I'm sure you can somehow import your Blender project and. Uh, and link the Blender library in any Python environment, you know what I mean? And then you have the Python environment you, you prefer, but it's just the assumption. I mean, yeah, people implement all kinds of stuff, especially like Python and Blender, I'm sure they did it all. Somebody built it for sure. Love that, but I, I wouldn't know what it entails. Uh, might be interesting, maybe, who knows, in, in 2.8. Okay, so let's move on to the next chapter, names and objects. So, or what, what does that dot actually mean? Well, in Python, we we're talking here about, uh, about names, like Python names and Python objects. And uh, in that sense, names refer to objects. An object is a thing in memory from Python's perspective. So this is uh, that, and as a clarification of what's on the cloud now, here I really talk about Python names and Python objects. So an object in Python can be anything. It can be five. Digit, number, it's an integer. And it's actually an object in Python's memory. But it can also be the, the BPy module. It's all of Blender composed of many different things. And because you can give it a name, it's also an object. So it can object means pretty much anything. Um, how does it work? Well, say you have uh, a ledge somewhere with a stack of monkeys, as, as one has, and you want to talk about one specific monkey, namely the third from the top, the one with the upside down tilted head. And that's quite a long way to describe this particular monkey, but it works. And you probably now know which monkey I'm talking about. Uh, but we could also call him Steve. And then the next time I'm talking about Steve, you guys also know, know what, what I mean. Even if you and move. this is basically all there is to it in Python as well. There's one thing, that monkey, there are no five monkeys named Steve. It's just that one monkey. That monkey doesn't change. It doesn't move because it's a photo. Uh, so it doesn't matter which name I use for it, that third monkey from the top on that particular ledge, or Steve. Bless you. 
And in Python, it's pretty much the same way. It's uh, not a ledge, it's vpy, and it's not that particular tile on that ledge where they are on, but it's dot data, and then you have dot objects. Oh and then you have the monkey, the monkey comparison. has location, location, Hilarious. And that is what that dot does. It becomes more specific. It walks down this hierarchy of, of names. But we can also call it state. <coughs> and after you've done this, these two things become exactly the same. Both set Steve's x location to minus 0 0.5. Except that it might be easier to read because it's all about Steve. Um, it's probably also easier to uh, avoid mistakes because if you have a whole line of these uh, data objects monkey dot do something with it. You have to be careful that on each and every line you have the same monkey. Maybe you have monkey one, monkey three, monkey five hundred, and you have to be careful that you always use it in the same way. Whereas if you say, okay, Steve is the monkey that I'm talking about now, and then do everything on Steve, it becomes much clearer. And it also becomes faster to execute, because every dot is a lookup in some table of names. Uh, so even for a blender itself, it will be faster to, if you say Steve, than if you say be part of data, the object itself, monkey. And this works perfectly until we allocate something else. So it could also say Steve is free, and that's the, the thing with Python. Name, uh, in Python, objects are really strict. They have a type, it's a mesh, it's a blender object, it's a digit. It's very strict, it won't change in the same way that that monkey uh, will always remain a monkey. But those names are interchangeable, and they can change dynamically what they are pointing to, and that's why uh, Python is called a dynamic language. Steve equals 3 is also perfectly valid, even if before we use Steve to point to a monkey, we can now say, okay, Steve now points to that object that represents the number 3. And then, of course, Steve.location.x equals something won't work. It will give an attribute error location to something. The something after the dot is called an attribute. I mean, and it says people without object, any history, programming bad, uh, uh, background, so if you, see you cannot the, tell the me that, like this, that you, you know that maybe understand something Steve here. Isn't what you no think. flex, but like, I don't uh, know. This, yes. Isn't it going a little bit fast? Yeah, whatever. I That's guess you have to start question. somewhere. Naming in the beginning, Steve it's a little bit confusing. To the file or to, to anything else. But uh, and yeah, because we're I'm a little bit trying to fi Python find out. All oh my gosh! Spark. Oh, I'm a little bit trying to find out what what is a good way to like explain something to such a skill diversified crowd, um, because like. If you have a little bit programming experience and you've seen those th things and you you know a little bit about those concepts, um, it's all kind of clear. And if you try to explain it, it all makes sense to you. But if you if you think back to how you learned it in the beginning, it was kind of tough. Well, for me, but. Um, yeah, if I like, if I went to, maybe I should stop the video and not mute it. Um, if I went to uh, a Blender conference, being an artist, um, the last twenty years of my life, and then going there, and after like twenty minutes, he talks about attribute error. Int object has no attribute location. I would be like, that. That would be the point for me where I say, guys, I'm out. W w what is this talk even about, right? And on the other hand, now that I'm not a person who uh, who spent the last 20 years of my life uh, being a pure um, artist, um, but I have actually have some years uh, of playing around with the coding concept and I've written some Python and so on, uh, for me, it's kind of clear and actually very boring what he talks about. So, yeah, I, I do not want to blame this guy, but I I wonder. Yeah, I'm just I'm just thinking loud about how to how to 
talk about technical or especially like programming things if you do not know your crowd or even worse if you know that your crowd ex um, yeah consists of experts and beginners or like experienced people and people who have never touched the field at all um yeah i don't know it seems like it's boring for the uh, for people who know it in the beginning uh, but already uselessly complex for people without knowledge like maybe people who have who've, who know it a little bit in the topic will get something out of the beginning and can somewhat follow in the end but I don't know I don't know um, yeah but just keep watching. I'm not. I'm not lost yet. <laughs> script from top to bottom, and at some point you say, "Okay, Steve is the thing I want to. I want to work with," and then you work with it. So every time. The I mean, okay, sorry to to interrupt again. Especially those topics. If you just listen to them, um, for me, I can only talk for myself. I would have never understand like programming. By listening to people explaining me things like oh execution is from top to bottom I would be like what is execution what top what bottom if you have never actually have hands-on experience all those words make no sense well to me so you you cannot like listen to one guy uh, talking 20 minutes and then know how to script uh, in Python you just need some little bit hands-on experience and try it out yourself and see, oh, if I uh, swap the, um, these two lines, so the assignment is on top and then the usage of the variable is at the bottom and if I do it the other way around, it's undefined and so on, <clears throat> then you can understand it. But if you hear someone talking about it, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, the line number two, three, and four have are but executing. but to be honest, I I'm I'm not any better. I'm not saying this this guy is talking crap. Um, I, I'm just saying it's a, diff a difficult topic, and I'm, I'm I'm trying to like yeah just think about it. Um, I have no idea how how one could do it better. Maybe yeah maybe he put in the talk description that you no it is addressed at no no no. He, he he pointed it out in the beginning, right? I said that um, it's aimed at us artists who want to learn a little bit about scripting. Yeah, maybe he he just wants to like bring out those those things, those names, and he wants the people to just swallow in and say, "Ah, oh, attribute error! I have to do it like that," and that they have a like. A little bit of overview of it and then they feel a little bit more comfortable just copy pasting it in and actually not knowing what they what they are doing yeah maybe it's that's what he's um, also trying to do that's what he um, yeah so he's not trying to explain uh, like actual Python uh, so that people understand how it works um, but like take away the fear of just opening the console for for some repetitive tasks as creating 30,000 uh, objects or whatever. Yeah, I don't know. I should I should probably just stop talking. <laughs> that number one has already been executed and Steve is available for use. That sounds a bit weird. Uh, <laughs> So this, this whole concept of we have a name, uh, what it refers to can change over time, uh, gives rise to Blender's context. And this is a thing that in your scripts you will use all the time. It's available as bpy.context.something, and that something depends on what you want to use it for. So you have dot .active object, which means the currently active object. You have dot .selected objects, which are the, is the list of currently selected objects, and so on. I'm going to speed up a little bit because it's already half past 11. Uh, so you can get be part of context.active object. If you want to know the name of it, you do dot name. Uh, if you want to have uh, the modifiers list, you 
get dot modifiers and then you can look it up by name again and then you have options of that particular modifier. You can keep dotting and dotting and dotting and this uh, you can also see in, if I can alt tab, yeah. So let's add, oh I can't click, let's add a modifier here, uh, this made modifier. And here you actually see that whole thing. So you got bpy.data.objects argosphere 300, because we just added a few, modifiers, decimate, vertex group. And that just gives you the information. But it's particular to this object. So say we have, I don't know, 300 icospheres, and we all added uh, meshes to that. You can replace this bit with object if you only want your script to look at the current active object. And sometimes you don't even need a name if you want to do, uh, but I'll skip that. <laughs> so to recap, everything is an object, names refer to objects, We've seen how to use a context very briefly, and you can just dig through these names with the dot and the control space in the uh, in the Python console. So you can look it up from that tooltip, but you can also just browse around, pressing dot control space, see what kind of list of interesting stuff you get. Next thing is stuff on list. It's called looping or iterating over a list. It's like going over a list and hitting everything in there. As I just said, object is a list of all the selected objects. It changes over time depending on what you do in, in Blender's interface. And let's just copy paste this into Blender and see what happens. There we go. I've selected a few. And there we have the name of the selected object. So the way it works is you say for some name, could be Steve, could be Ob, because we're now working with objects, we usually use Ob, uh, in whatever thing that contains many things that you want to loop over uh, and oh, a column. It's a big trap. And after that, you can see that I put four spaces. And this is how Python knows which bits to keep repeating and which bits not. Uh, so I can do this again and do that and then go back and say uh, print hello. And APT package, what? No. Oh my gosh. Uh, package. It's, it's wonderful, it's wonderful. Um, it's probably me messing around with my Blender install as I'm a developer and mess around with stuff. Uh, what you would have seen was all those names because that first print statement was indented. That meant that it was part of the loop body and then the next print statement was pulled back again that means it's not part of the loop body, so it's only executed after the loop is done. Uh, yes. Uh, do you need four spaces exactly? Uh, yes and no. Um, it's it's all up to you as far as Python is concerned. So any consistent white space would do. If you want to use a tab character, that's fine. If you want to use two spaces or eight spaces, that's fine. Uh, and unfortunately, nowadays, uh, mixing up spaces and tabs is forbidden, um, as long as you're consistent. So that's the yes part of this answer. The no part is that there is the Python standard guide, and that says, okay, just use four spaces. Uh, if you Google it, it's P-E-P-8, -P 
the pet enhancement, the Python enhancement proposal number eight, that shows you how to name things, when to use uh, underscores between words, when to use capital letters, when to use, how many spaces to use, etc. And the thing is, if you adhere to that, initially it's your own personal choice because it's your own personal script. But then if you want to go on to, say, the Stack Exchange website, you want to have some help with your script because you can't figure something out, it really helps in your response um, if you follow that standard Python style guide. Then people will be uh, more likely to understand what you're coding because it's easier for, for their eyes because they're used to it. And it's more likely that you get a useful answer. It's also for collabor collaboration. It's nice if everybody uses the same programming style. So another thing that we can do is not just print print a name, but we can also modify a name. So we can just say op.name equals op.name.upper. So let's see if I can copy paste this in here and no, you know what? Just let's just restart Blender. Let's duplicate this cube a few times. Select everything. Object name equals object name to the upper. And what this does is it, it goes, looks over all the selected objects. And then, in a really stupid way, it says, okay, I have to assign something to something else. That means that I have to do this part first, because otherwise I don't know what to do with the rest. So it computes op.name.upper. That becomes cube in all capital letters, uh, because you can do it. Like cube.upper is cube. And then it assigns it to op.name again. So it's a it can look very strange that you say, well, the name is not quite the name. And if you say that to somebody, they may think you're a bit thin in the head. Uh, but for a computer, this actually makes sense because it sees this as, as something to execute. And now we should see, well, there you have it in the corner. It's all capitalized. So you could extend this uh, question, yes. So the question is, is op.name now defined as op.name.upper and will that stay that way um, or is something else going on? Yeah, I, yes. Uh, something else is going on. <laughs> oh. a, a name refers to an object. So before I did this, the cube was called cube with a capital C and lowercase rest. And that string of characters cube was in memory. And then op.name was just a little pointer pointing at it saying, yeah, that, that is my name. That's my content, basically. That's my name. And then what we did was take that, construct a new string in memory. That is cube with all capitals. And that is basically this part. This says, construct that for me in memory. And then by assigning it to this name, that little pointer of the name that pointed to the original string now points to the new one. And that is a, a fixed situation that if you change, your, if save your blend file, that is what will be saved to disk, the content of Blender's memory. I hope that answers your question. So the relation... Um, yes. <coughs> of, of the, so the, the question is if you. Right, 
so the question is, will it mess up something in the future because I'm now redefining something? And maybe you forget that you've redefined something and will that cause problems in the future? I think it's a, a brilliant question. Um, it won't mess up anything. Uh, that relationship that it was something else that we turned into an uppercase version of itself, after this has been executed, it's forgotten. Uh, it doesn't matter, it's the new thing now, it's the new name. Uh, so if Steve becomes Alan, then from then on it's Alan. And that the history is forgotten. So it's exactly the same as if you would go to every single object, go to his name property, type in the name in capital letters. That would do exactly the same thing as in this script, except that here you've automated it. Very good question. What would happen if um, you would rename an object to a name that already exists? Exactly the same as what would happen if you typed it in. So I think by heart it would change the object to the name that you give it, and then the other one gets the dot zero zero something suffix. Uh, so, and that is a very good question. Uh, it hints on what I'm not going to be able to reach, I think, in the presentation, so I'll just do it now. Um, a lot of scripters uh, think about these objects in, in, say, lender objects by name. So that's cube, that's Steve, that's uh, Victor, that's uh, Coro. And when you start scripting, it's very, very tempting to keep using that name. Especially since in the tooltip, you also see bpy.data uh, objects and then the name of the object. So it seems like a nice identifier for the thing. And my suggestion is don't. Um, I can see if I can reach to that slide. Here we go. So don't try this at home. Um, every uh, script, if you start running it from the, uh, anything but the Python console, it has to start with info bpy. Uh, that binds the name bpy to Blender's Python interface, and from then on you can do bpy.something. Uh, before that, Python doesn't even know you want to use it as, as that name. In the Python console in, in Blender, this is already done for you as a convenience, um, but in your script you have to do it yourself. And then we create a cube in, in the same way, just plain copy-paste from the user interface, and I call a function reset position with the name of that cube, because I know, right, if you create a cube, it's called cube. And reset position, so I'm, I'm skipped ahead a bit. You can define functions where there are bits of code that take a name. In this case, it's uh, reset position. And it gets parameters. In this case, it's op name. And that parameter points to whatever I put in. So in this case, this contains the string cube. This looks up, as we've seen before, bpy data objects cube. And then we set the location to zero. It's a silly example, but brings across what's, what's going on. Um, because that cube might not be cube. It might be cube.0025 if you're already added a few. Uh, so th this is something tricky because it may break your code unexpectedly. You may test this on an empty vendor file and it will just work fine. Or maybe you test this with a default cube and then adding an icosphere and it will work fine. But then for other people it won't. So that's so tricky about using names. Also, names are not unique, and this is something people also tend to forget. You can link in uh, objects from other blend files. So I can have a cube that is local to this blend file, and I can link in a cube that is stored in another blend file. And then if you have 25 of those cubes linked in, they can all be called cube, LinkedIn. but all come from different mm -hmm. blend files. So you never know which one you will get if you just use the, use the name. So the solution is, as you guys all know, because you're all Blender artists, if you add a cube, it becomes the active object. And we've seen bpy.context.active object, which 
as a reference to exactly that object that was just added. And if you use that, pass it as a parameter, then you can just say object location equals 0, 0, 0, and you've done exactly the same thing as you've done before, except that you're 100% certain it works on the object that you just added. So that's a little discretion, a uh, little sidetrack on naming. Any questions about this? Yeah. Oh, maybe just grab this one so I don't have to repeat it. So let's look at a more, or actually useful example. Uh, say you uh, want to select all hidden objects that have dot zero zero in their name. Um, this is just an example, but I think you can always already see that if you can do this, you can also say select everything that has dot zero zero in their name. And you also know how to manipulate the name, so then you can say remove that dot something suffix from it. Like this you can extend to, oh, I've duplicated all my objects and then removed the originals and now I want to re get rid of all these dot something something suffixes. This is the kind of code that you would use. So again, it starts with import pypy, then a little comment. It's very important when coding. Comment the broad steps of your code and when it comes a little bit trickier, also comment why you're doing it that way. The what should be clear in your code but the why is often forgotten, and that is so important when you look at back at it, like after this trustful deadline is gone, and you want to look at your code again, or what the hell was it doing, you want to know what you were thinking. So we're going to select all hidden objects, which means that after this, I want that my selection reflects that. So we start by deselecting everything, then we go over all the objects in the current scene. So the current scene is given by BPEC, scene, and all the objects that are linked in that scene you can find in that objects. We loop over them. Object that hide is either true or false. It's a checkbox. It's called a boolean after Mr. Bull, who invented all the logic behind that. And with an if statement, you can say, okay, if this is true, then do this, else do that. The else clause is optional. Uh, so this allows your code to branch. So far we've seen stuff that always happened. Every name was converted to uppercase. Here we can be more granular. 
So if it's not hidden, it doesn't match our criteria of the objects we want to operate on, so we say continue. That means stop with whatever you're doing in this iteration with this particular object, skip whatever I'm going to write next, and just go to the next iteration of the for loop, go look at the next object. If dot zero zero not in op dot name, some string in some other string gives you a true or a false depending on whether it's in there or not. And if you add a not in between, then it's exactly the opposite. So it it reads pretty much like English. This that's also why I like Python. It's very very readable. Uh, who agrees, by the way, that this is readable? Pretty okay. Who, who thinks this is not readable? Yeah, yes, compare it to assembly and ask um, again. <laughs> in a sense, uh, it's a flow control command, so it does cause um, your your code execution path to jump. In this case, it basically means uh, skip to all the way to the end of this for block and continue with the next one. If you were on the last uh, object, it would just stop looping because it's done. If you're on the first, it will continue to the second, etc. And this is also an approach that I really like to do. Um, I will. It's been messing up the indentation. Uh, this will cause an error because Python won't understand what I mean. This has to be like four spaces that way. Uh, I will try and fix this before I put the slides online. Um, but. This is what we actually want to do. We wanted to select it, so we set the select property to true, and we want to unhide it because otherwise, yeah, with the were hidden, you can't select it in objects. But I want to see what's going on. I want to do something with it with that selection later. Maybe delete it. Maybe move them to a different layer. Uh, so I want to unhide them. So I set up that hide equals false, and that is that script that selects all hidden objects that have dot zero zero in their name. And as you can see, I've taken a bit of an opposite approach to this. Instead of saying if the object's hidden and it has dot zero zero in object name, I'm going to execute this code. And that's perfectly fine, but it does mean that if you add yet another condition, maybe you want to check that the color is red. Maybe you want to check that it's actually a mesh, ob mesh object before doing something. That one if statement becomes longer and longer and longer and longer. And with this, you just add two more lines to your to your code, and then the bit that actually does something is always here at the bottom. It's much easier to spot. Yes. Yes, it's all about we loop over everything here. This is indiscriminatory everything. Then we exclude what we don't want to see. And then we do the do the thing, and I, I I apply this to pretty much every programming I do. Also on Blender Cloud, uh, say you have some entry point into the web server, and then I say if you are not allowed to do this, return an error message, and then it breaks away from the control flow. It returns that error message. You're done. So in the end, when you see those steps of validation and maybe you type your passwording wrong, et cetera, et cetera, then you get to the block that actually does the thing. And if you do, if it's good, then if it's good, and if the other thing is good, and if the other thing is good, you start moving to the side, and then you get to the else class. Oh, but if that one wasn't good, then we have to do this. And then the password was wrong, then we do this. Oh, you didn't type the password at all. Oh, that was there. And you get this curve in your, in your code. It becomes a mess. So excluding is a, it's a nice approach. Um, well, you, yes, another question. Hello, two questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, are we able to assign something with a frame number? And the second question, can we put in some code that gets called when the frame changes? Thank you. Uh, the answers are yes and yes. Thank you. <laughs> 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 
Wow. Uh, so, frames. Um, or putting stuff in F curves. You can do that. Um, basically, you have to do a few different steps. Uh, I hope I still know them by heart. I've used it a lot myself. Uh, with the crowd, anima uh, the, the crowd simulation that I did during my PhD research, I had wanted to do this a lot. Uh, I used the game engine to run the simulation, which recorded all the motions of the crowd agents to F curves. And then I also wanted to store some choices that my uh, crowd simulation system made and also put them into animation data. Um, angles that it found between different characters, uh, distances, that kind of stuff. Um, so basically what you have to do is first you have to ensure that there is an animation data data block for that particular object. Um, which is something like bpy. Uh, uh, I'm going to see C by the way, because here you see C equals part of context, so here you can just type C. It's like your context, Steve. Steve. Yeah. Uh, C dot active object. Um, animation data lives on the on the object level, so this, and then animation. There we go. Data. Create. Create animation data to this ID. ID is another word for data block, a thing in Blender's memory. Um, note that not all the ID types support this. Yeah, fine, we know it's a mesh, it does. So this creates an anim data object. Uh, and then, there we go, that's dot animation data. It's an optimization. Like normally in the user interface, you don't have to do this. You just say, I want to have a keyframe here, and then Blender does this behind the scenes. But when you're scripting, you have to do this automatically. It doesn't create animation data for every object, because that would be very inefficient. Um, so now that we have this, um, how do we do that again? Well, you can see the drivers. You can see, hey, there we go. Keyframe, insert. And that takes all the way there. There we go. A data path, an index, a frame. That data path you can also get from the user interface. So these are the things that are uh, location or location bracket zero. So let's say if I want to keyframe the location. There you go, copy data path. And we paste it in. Press the wrong button. Oh, this happens by the way. Um, you see the little dots that did change? The standard prompt is uh, little arrows. It changes to dots. It did that in for loop. When I indented, I did the column, it knew I had to have an indented bit of code, so it started with the dots and it stops that and when it understands that you're done. Here I try to do backspace, I hit enter. Uh, and it has an open bracket. It knows this has to be balanced. So if you see those dots, you know that you've told Python something that needs to be continued. And to get out of this, you can try and keep entering, but it doesn't work. So you have to just close the thing, swallow the error message that you get. Jesus, uh, now I hope that it's still working. Um, so the data path equals one. Then, uh, sorry, equals our location. Then we had that index that had the default value of minus one, which means no, no index whatsoever. This works for uh, um, a property that's just one number, um, opacity. That we have index minus one because it's one number. But location, as we've seen, takes a zero, one, two. It consists of multiple things, a color as well. Um, so then we have to say uh, the index, well, Say we want to change the x coordinate, index 0, add a certain frame, let's say frame 25. Uh, is that enough? No, I ruined it. I have ruined it. That's beautiful. No. That's the live demo effect. I've never seen this error before. Uh, that's it. Restart Blender. Yeah. Oh well. 
Uh, in short, that is the, the keyframe insert function is where you want to be. Then you can, yes. So say that again, you can copy from? Maybe you could copy from the log window or apps from the From the log window, yeah. Yeah, you could do that. I hardly use that myself, but <coughs> there are people very happy with it. Do you say insert single keyframe? No. Nothing coming up. So I think that there you go. I'm moving it here, what does it say? Yeah, it just has that translate operator call here, because that log window, it doesn't log everything that's happening. It logs the operators, and operators are the bits of code that are linked to hotkeys, menu items, buttons, everything, all the, the user interface stuff. Um, but inserting a keyframe, as we saw, was calling a function on that item data, and that's not an operator, so it won't get logged there. Um, the default frame is the current frame, but you can also say, I want to insert it at frame one, two, three, four, five. So you could be reading in uh, a text file that has location, like on every line has like three numbers for the location. You could loop over every line, split every line into three numbers, and create keyframes from that. This is actually a good one because it's fast. It doesn't need it doesn't require Blender to change the current frame, uh, so you can just insert keyframes like that. Uh, if you say, okay, current frame equals something, then you move Blender to a new frame, and then you use some operator to insert that keyframe there, and then you move to the next frame. That's going to be much slower. So we're already one minute past, and we still move work. Yeah, well, this is basically what we've already seen, except that now there's 600 tiny monkeys, and I don't do them in a straight line, but in a grid of uh, 25 row, uh, rows of 25. If you're interested in how to create the monkeys, how to smooth them, subdivide them, you can do it like this. I will race through the slide. I will be here today and tomorrow if you have questions. Um, Maybe if more people have questions or are interested in more scripting stuff, we can book a room. I, we can do a more uh, like a smaller skill workshop. Uh, walk up to me and then we can do that. Um, one common thing, and that's the last thing I want to really cover, is do not modify the collection that you're looking over. If you're looking over all selected objects, don't start selecting other what objects. What a crappy door. <laughs> Because oh you're looping over that list of selected objects. If you start changing that, Python becomes confused, things drop out, uh, it could crash, it could just skip certain objects. Um, so don't do that. So here, this will fail. Like you're looping over a context of selected objects, you say auto select equals false. So a much safer approach is to create a list of empty lists, that's the square brackets. to deselect.append will append the object to that list and that's that's all we do. So instead of having Steve, it becomes to deselect zero and then the next one becomes to deselect one and then to deselect. So while we're looking over the selected objects, we're just adding them to a list if we find them interesting. And then once we're done, we say, okay, for every object in this list that we found interesting, we're going to do something. We're going to deselect them. And now we're no longer looping over these selected objects, but just over to deselect. And again, we're not changing to deselect, we're just looping over it. And by the time we're done, Python knows that. Nice, the video is over. <laughs> what? That was unexpected, boys. Um, okay. You know what that means. The video is over. The video is over. Um, that was this episode on Laser Gurkenland. Um, repairing the base that got found three times already. Um, yeah, I don't know what I'm doing here. <laughs> and yeah, we, we just keep going. 
Um, yeah, just come check the server out and play with me. Please do not destroy my base. And this golden hole is shit. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know what I expected. But I'm so super rich that I have more gold than stone or wood. So I decided to use my gold for that. Mm. Cool. I will probably burn more sticks if I... More wood do, due to sticks if I keep uh, crafting those golden holes but um, yeah whatever um, yeah do not um, misunderstand my rant on the video because I didn't <laughs> um, yeah I enjoyed it and I will probably keep watching the series uh, if the other parts are still um, licensed under Creative Commons because I noticed uh, recently uploaded videos um, under the scripting for artists domain are no longer under Creative uh, Commons, so I won't um, be able to watch them here uh, in the video, which is kind of sad, without uh, violating uh, the copyright of the author. Um, yeah, so let's see how that goes and that's that's it and make sure to maybe connect via the domain let's show the domain in, at the end of the video at sillyhoon.com that will be a domain i can control uh better than the ip address and if something goes wrong and i have to change the host again which is kind of unlike unlikely um yeah this this domain will will got you back but yeah as, as this is a long-term project um i wanted to um yeah give you guys as much information that i can if i get get inactive for a few years and you have no way to contact me uh, you can use these videos as uh, as a resource um, on w what happened with the server where is the server reachable under which domain ip whatever um, i can tell you that it is very likely even if i'm inactive that this server will stay up for some time and if i say for some time i'm talking years baby um yeah and i i can tell you that because i'm hosting uh, game servers already since 10 years so um the experience from the past can give me some base on uh, making assumptions about the future right um Alrighty boys, so that's it from this episode and see you in the next advertisement episode for this uh, Minecraft server. Bye.